It is that time. It is that time. It is that wonderful time. This word that is about to bless your life, I believe is just going to be revolutionary. Revolutionary during study. God kind of threw me a curveball, which might come for your life in like the first 15 minutes of the message. But I believe that this is going to be powerful. I do want to encourage you to continue to be intentional. Healing, spiritual growth, and health does not happen by accident. So I want to applaud all of you who have been so intentional with just being persistent with your spiritual growth and evolution. And I'm honored to be an assistant to your journey. So I want to get to work on tonight to prove to you how much I'm ready to get into work. Here's the title of tonight's message. We are talking about after the breakup after the breakup i know that this is virtual but i'm gonna try to make this personal can i get everybody to put in the room this is going to be good this this is going to be good somebody else might put in the room i need this bro i need this girl after the breakup i want to talk about this because i want you to know that you still have your kingdom identity you still have your kingdom identity just because it's over does not mean your story is over. In fact, for some of us, just because it's over, we need to understand that wasn't the title of your life. It's not even the chapter for some of us. It's just a page. There are many pages left in this chapter. There are more chapters after this chapter. That wasn't even a chapter. It is just a page in the chapter of your story. My goal and my desire on tonight is to assist you and help you to know how to move on, but not just move on, but to move on right. That part though, not just move on, but to be able to move on right. And I think the reason for many of us, it has been such a struggle to move on. It is twofold. The reason it is so hard for you to move on is because you walked away hoping that they would stop you. That's why it's a struggle for you to move on because you tried to move on hoping they would stop you. I know that I have to be worth more than what they said to me. I know all the time I invested, all the energy I invested, all the effort I've invested, all the love I invested, all the finances I invested. The reason it's so hard for you to move on, ma'am, for you to move on, sir, is because you moved hoping that they would stop you. So now you're in a place where you're questioning your worth because they let you go. Why do I feel like tears are already starting to like form in somebody's eyes? Like maybe it's so hard for you to move on because I thought when I began to walk away that I was so good to them that they would stop me. Maybe that's why it's difficult for you to move on after the breakup. Or second reason, could it be so hard for you to move on because you don't know how to grieve over somebody who's still alive. That part though, like we have been taught how to grieve when somebody is no longer here. But how did you grieve when I had to eulogize the relationship, but the person's not in the cemetery? They're very much alive. I see them at work. We sing in the choir together. I see them on social media. I have children with them. How do I grieve over something that's dead, but the person is still alive? God, would you flood this atmosphere right now? Help us to be able to understand your will for our life is better than our will. Help us, God, to be able to heal and behave, be able to move on, but not just move on for the sake of moving on, but move on with health. Move on right. Move on with clarity. Move on so that we don't heal crooked, but that we can operate in wholeness. I pray that you anoint this word. All the study means absolutely nothing if you are magnified and glorified. Use me as your oracle, as the PA system of heaven. In Jesus' name, everybody who agrees with that prayer, would you drop in the room? Amen. 
I just feel it. I can't see y'all comments, but I just feel somebody said that part right there. How do you grieve over somebody who's still alive? I felt that all in my soul. I felt that it is confession time. Let me get everybody to put this in the room. Can I get everybody to put this in the room in all caps real short on tonight? There's still more after this. Yes, put in the room. There is still more after this, after the breakup, after the breakup, after the breakup. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, I want to serve you on tonight. My desire is to serve you from a biblical perspective on why breakups happen, why some of them were even necessary, because some breakups are due to the divine and other breakups are self-induced. See, y'all not gonna like me for about the next 15 minutes. Some breakups are God's doing, he does have better, then other breakups are self-induced. I know, I know we always like to think the counterfeit was them. I know we always like to think the problem was them. I know, I know we always like to think that all the red flags were coming from them. But what if I told you the biggest red flag is when you can't see that you're one? See, see, I know we always think it's them, but what if I told you that many times the biggest red flag is when you can't see that you're one. Like we keep sabotaging relationships and yes, it hurts. It hurts, but the problem is we're blindfolded to the role that we keep playing in our suffering that we keep birthing. I need to say that again. We are, sab we are sabotaging relationships, and yes, it hurts. The problem is we are blindfolded to the role that we are playing in our own suffering, in our own suffering that we keep birthing. Just like God loves you, he also loves them. I know you don't like that because somebody watching this, you can't stand your ex. <laughs> you can't stand your ex. I don't know how God can love anybody. Just like God loves you, he also loves them. And I know I, I could preach this from a typical sermonic message and I can get people to shout. I, I could preach about how they moved, how they moved on and they missed out. And, and I could preach that and I can get your emotions all around and I can begin to preach stuff like, you know what? God is about to allow you to enter into a season where some people would wish that they have treated you better. And then people would say fire in the chat and you better preach Jerry and, and all this type of stuff. I could preach that. I could preach that. Yes, what they did behind your back, God's about to bless you in front of their face. I, I could preach that and we'll clap and we'll say hallelujah and we'll say fire, fire and share this and like this and girl, come join this. And my dude, you got to check this out. I could preach about how back then they didn't want you and now you're hot. They all on you. I could preach that, but that's not biblical. That's Mike Jones. That's not kingdom. <laughs> That's not kingdom. That's Mike Jones. I could preach a message to start to cause for your emotions to be in agreement with it. And I'll get likes. And I'll get subscriptions. And I'll get shares. And it might grow the platform. And it might get bigger offerings. Watch this. At the expense of a narcissist walking away feeling justified in his behavior. This is so good, y'all. Yeah, I, I could preach an emotional responding message at the expense of a man who has anger issues feeling justified from this sermon and will walk away feeling like his fits of rage are okay. I could preach that because bad doctrine gives you bad routes and bad routes are due to bad directions. Did you hear what I just said? Bad doctrine leads you to bad routes and bad routes are due to bad directions. I could preach that. I could preach that. It's what most ministries do. Preach for an emotional response versus biblical life change. I could preach that at the expense 
of the woman with the sharp tongue. I told you about 15 minutes. 15 minutes, you're not going to like me. I could preach. I could preach that at the expense of a woman with a sharp tongue feeling justified with the way she talks. When the problem was your mouth, ma'am, and I'm not leaning on one side or another side. It, the problem was your mouth, sir. The problem was the manipulation. The problem was the lying. I said, I'm sorry though, but uh, here's the problem. You were sorry when you got caught, but you weren't as apologetic when nobody knew. See, I could preach that, but what is the point of preaching messages that cause for our emotions to get activated, but our heart stays stagnant? The two sides, the two sides of this paradigm when it comes to a breakup. Sometimes it is God. God will wreck your plans when he sees that your plans will wreck you. God will interfere when he sees that who you're with is interfering with your assignment. God will. That is the side that is most often preached. But what about the other side that maybe this breakup was due to me? I want to give you biblical examples. I don't want to just give you opinion, opinions. I want to give you biblical examples. First, John chapter 6, verse 70. We're going to hop around the scriptures here. John chapter 6, verse 70. It's 70. It says, Then Jesus replied, Have I not chosen you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. He meant Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, who, though one of the 12, was later to betray him. Now, look at this. Luke chapter 22. This is the passage of scripture where he actually does it. Luke chapter 22, verse 47. It says, while he was still speaking, a crowd came up. And the man who was called Judas, one we just talked about, one of the 12, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. That pain hits different when it's somebody close enough that can kiss you. Isn't it? He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying the son of man with a kiss? This, this is something that tripped me out. The whole time in Jesus' ministry, while Jesus was doing all of these awesome things, a devil was there too. Jesus is preaching, a devil is there too. Jesus is eating, a devil is there too. Jesus is on a boat, a devil is there too. Jesus is in a storm, a devil is there too. Jesus is doing miracles, a devil is there too. Judas is seeing these miracles, a devil is there. All of this is happening, and look, to add insult to injury, when Jesus was sending out the disciples, Two by two to cast out spirits. Look, give your Bible. Mark chapter six. Mark chapter six, verse six. It says, then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the 12 to him. He began to send them out two by two. As I was studying, I was like, man, I wonder who Jesus partner, who Judas partner was. I don't know why God, I just want to know. Who was it? Like, who was the one he was assigned to? Sent out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. This hits y'all because it means that saving faith is not the same as religious activity. Did you hear me? Saving faith is not the same as religious activity. This now makes sense why Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 7 verse 22, many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And did we not drive out demons in your name and perform miracles in your name? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evil doers. It's not always them. Could it be that the devil has been using us? But don't judge Judas. <laughs> don't judge Judas like Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Many of us do it for free. <laughs> Myself included. 
This isn't just to you. This is a double-edged sword. It cuts the pastor and it also cuts people listening. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Don't judge him. Many of us do it for free. It reminds me of this, this quote I saw on social media a few years ago. Judas had the best pastor. Judas had the best leader. Judas had the best counselor and still betrayed him. It's not always them. Sometimes it's me. And of course, all things work together. And this was a part of the redemptive story. Sometimes the most painful kiss is a Judas kiss, but the most purposeful kiss is a Judas kiss. You changed due to what you did. Is this too real? I've been around brothers and sisters who have hurt people so much where they said to themselves, I got problems. I need to change. I need therapy. My attitude is a problem. What my mother did to me still affects me. I need to change. This happened to me the first few years of my marriage. I was, I was projecting on my wife, being transparent. I don't mind being transparent. Projecting on my wife, thinking I was protecting my wife. So I'm like, listen, ministry's rough. You can't trust anybody. You got to understand. You got to be tough. 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 And so due to me trying to get her to be tough, I wasn't being tender. Because I think being a pastor is one of the one of the most amazing opportunities you can have in time. But it's also one of the most difficult. You could pray for people and be there when they're going through a crisis. Eulogize their loved ones. You could do funerals. But then they just leave. No email. No call. Just leave. They'll do it. They'll do it. He'll do it. People that you thought were on your team, they'll do it. They'll do it. And it happens over and over and over and over. So in this phase of my life, I'm trying to protect her because I'm scared of what happened to me will also happen to her. So I think I'm protecting her, but I'm underserving her with tenderness. So there's a quality that she needed from her husband. But because I was broken, because I was scared of being hurt again, because I was wounded, I was wounding her. Sometimes, sometimes we change because of the people we have hurt. God was showing me like, listen, you, you cannot be an effective spiritual doctor if you keep on catching symptoms and viruses to the, from the people that you're trying to serve. You can't be an effective doctor. You can't. Sometimes it's them, and then other times it's you. Now, I want to put my foot on the gas a little more because before we move on, I know the message is entitled After the Breakup. Before we move on, it is paramount that we perform a relational autopsy. I have to. I have to perform a relational autopsy. What was the cause of death? Don't just move on. Hold on, wait. What caused for this to die? Was this a homicide? Or was this something God is trying to purify? What was the cause of death to this relationship? Was it a homicide? I killed something. They killed something. We murdered something together. Or was it God purifying to clean your life? because he has something greater in store for your life. So I'm gonna put my foot on the gas. We're not done with this yet. How do you know if it's you? I'm glad you asked. I'm gonna give you some pointers. Number one, it might be you if you produce junkyards versus skyscrapers. Lord, let me wipe my sweat. <laughs> it might be you if you produce junkyards Versus skyscrapers. Every single time I look back on whoever I was in a relationship with, it looks like rubble. I, I just tear down their confidence. I just tear down their esteem. Does it look like a junkyard or do I build things up? Because the lack of my wholeness creates in them brokenness. 
This is so powerful, y'all. The lack of my wholeness can create in them brokenness. I told you before, a whole glass can quench your thirst. But that same glass, if broken, can cut you. Am I causing junkyards or am I building skyscrapers? Listen, just because you don't put your hands on them does not mean you're not abusive. I never lay my hands on a woman. I think that's weak. I think that's weak for any dude to lay his hands on them. Okay, you didn't lay your hands on her, but you laid your words on her. Just because you haven't physically laid your hands on them does not mean you're not abusive. And ladies, y'all are not off the hook. There are a lot of brothers who have experienced ample amount of abuse due to your mouth. Ooh, sis, your mouth. Like your mouth, like you be tweaking. You've caught so many bodies with your mouth that you could be called an undertaker. I mean, just, just hurt no boy. That's why you sorry. That's why you can't put it down in the bedroom. That's why I'm messing with your cousin. That's why you did, like, you trying to hurt him, destroy him, because you're hurt too. Do I produce, oh, this is hitting. Do I produce junkyards or do I produce skyscrapers? This might be education to some, but then a reminder to others. You might even have this highlighted in your Bible or possibly have read it today on somebody's caption on social media. It derives from Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. The scripture informs us that death and life, y'all finish it, put it in the room, put it in the room. Death and life are in the power of what? Your tongue. So the quintessential question that we have to ask ourselves is the condition of my mouth, is it a grim reaper or a delivery unit? It might be you. My mouth is a grim reaper. It produced death. Or is my mouth a delivery unit? It births life. If you were a boxing coach, due to the condition of your mouth, could you help whoever you're training defeat who they're fighting due to how you talk? <laughs> I used to box before the pandemic and many times while I'm sparring, I would hear my coach say, put up your left. So I put up my left. Watch his right. I had a language in my life that knew how to help me fight. If you're a coach and you're a trainer, based on the condition of your mouth, Will you help him win against his opponent, his adversary, or will you assist the adversary? Might be you if you produce junkyards versus skyscrapers. Number two, it might be you if you're the teacher, never the student. <laughs> never the student. Like something is wrong if you are never wrong, bruh. Something is wrong if you are never wrong, sis. The worst combination in the world is when somebody is arrogant and ignorant because when you are arrogant you think you know everything but when you are ignorant this means you don't know a thing the worst combination in the world see these type of people these type of people don't listen when you talk but then blame you when you walk <laughs> they don't listen to nothing you have to say they blame you they blame you when you walk, but they weren't listening when you talk. Like even when you're talking, I'm not listening to understand. I'm just sitting here waiting on my turn. I'm just waiting on my turn. It's the pursuit of gaining understanding. That is a part of the foundation of love. Listen, y'all, long lasting love, kingdom love, the foundation of lasting love is sacrifice, learning, and unlearning. Did you hear me? Lasting love, kingdom, biblical, lasting love, the foundation of it is sacrifice, learning, and unlearning. I have to learn what the scriptures define love as, and I have to unlearn what I thought love was. I thought it was about how they make me feel. No, that's lust. We just talked about that on Thursday. What does the Bible say love is? See, husbands, this is imperative for men because you set the tone. 
You set the tone. And there is nothing more frustrating to a woman than when her husband is tone deaf. Did y'all hear what I just said? Husbands, you set the tone. And there's nothing more frustrating to a wife than when her husband is tone deaf. Can you hear the chord of heaven? Like, can you match key? Can you match that key? Because the way you treat me hurts. <laughs> the way you're treating me hurts. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 12, it says, Do you see a person wise in their own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for them. Maybe it's you if you're the teacher, never the student. Number three, maybe it's you when you have to have control. Like being with you feels like bondage. Being with you feels like bondage. It is an interrogation process whenever I want to go somewhere. And I'm not talking about due to you being caught in a lie or a relationship or marriage that's trying to continue on after somebody's been unfaithful. That's not them being insecure by asking you questions. It's just that due to my lack of faithfulness, I've caused an insecurity there. So don't confuse what I'm saying. Don't confuse what I'm saying. If there has been unfaithfulness or a lack of honesty and they're asking you questions, it's because there was a time I believed you. Now I don't really know if you're telling the truth. That's different, all right? I'm talking about none of that exists, but to be with them, you have to have an interrogation process whenever you're going somewhere. Where you going? Why you going there? Who going to be there? How many people going to be there? Well, I'm going too. Why you going? And then they try to always make your friends seem wrong. Like something's wrong with your friends, something wrong with your family. They're never going to say go hang with your family. <laughs> Ever. They almost like try to isolate you. They try to control you. It is a constant isolation. Your, your mind. They twist their insecurity and project it as your flaw. And this is not just in a relational context. A lot of us have experienced this. Mm. A lot of us have experienced this in church. In church. That's my son. That's, that's my daughter. You didn't get my blessing before you went over there. You didn't get my permission before you went. You didn't honor me. You didn't, you didn't honor me. Bro, are you God? Are you God? <laughs> so I'm dealing with church trauma due to a leader who's insecure. Listen, y'all, healing scares people who benefit from your brokenness. One more time. Healing scares people who benefit from your brokenness. They will end up trying to change who you are to become what they need. Maybe it's you if you have to have control. Number four, maybe it's you if you're petty. Gosh, I know somebody's like, this is not the direction I thought that this message would go. We gonna go there in a minute about how it could be God and he has better. We can go there in a minute. But I just want us to understand this. Maybe it's you if you're petty. Well, what is petty? Petty is a calculated comment. It is a calculated comment or response that is saturated in holding a record of wrong that you're throwing in their face when they're voicing a concern. One more again. Not one more time. One more again. Petty, the definition of petty, this is just mine. Petty is a calculated, you have time to think about this. It is a calculated comment that is saturated in holding a record of wrong that you're throwing in their face when they're voicing a concern. Why you didn't answer your phone? Uh, why you didn't ask your phone last week when you went out to eat with Jonathan? You've been thinking about this one, man. You've been thinking about this. It's calculated. <laughs> Maybe it's you. You're petty. You're petty. Listen, y'all. You cannot want mature love or being childish. You can't. Is everything have to go your way? That's childish. Children throw temper tantrums when they don't get their way. Maybe. We have to consider what Proverbs chapter 21, Proverbs chapter 25 tells us, verse 21, it says, if your enemy is hungry, give him food to eat. Opposite of culture. If he is thirsty, give him water to drink. In doing this, you are, you will heap burning coals on his head and the Lord will reward you. So instead of you rewarding your flesh by being petty back, do good to them. Do good to them. 
This could be to a boss. This could be to a family member. I don't have to be petty because nobody can reward me like the Lord. Number five, maybe it's you if you're not faithful. Faithfulness is a constant choice to remain. People don't abandon things that they want. They abandon things that they were using. We have a whole generation, I just did a video about this, a whole generation who claims they value loyalty when truth is most of us are loyal to opportunities. We're not loyal to people. Maybe it's you. Maybe it's you because you're not faithful. Number six, oh we, maybe it's you if you're a liar. If you're a liar. Hear me, one lie causes one to question all truths. Just one. I don't understand what, you lied, ma'am. You're a liar, sir. Like you lie for no reason. It, it don't even make sense. Where are you going? Yeah, I'm going to Walmart. No, you're, you know you're not going to Walmart. Like lie just to lie. <laughs> lie just to lie. And what's worse, Taurus, I'm about to throw my towel. What's worse is when you are upset that the person is not believing the lies that you keep telling. Like you actually, what you mean? Why you don't believe? You know you lying. How are you going to get more upset that they don't believe your lie? Are you getting upset because you can't control them or deceive them anymore? Maybe it's you if you lie. Things break apart easier when they were being held together by a lie. If I was a note taker, I would write that down. Things break apart easier when they were being held together by a lie. Sometimes it's not just a lie. Like, I don't understand why they keep acting like that. Like, they said they forgive me. You know what they could be struggling with? It's not that I don't forgive you for lying. It's the warfare I have to go through. Every single time you tell me something, I have to battle. Are you really telling me the truth? Like, I, I have to deal with that frustrates me. That frustrates me that now every single time you say you're going somewhere, you didn't call them, you didn't. I have to battle, are they really telling the truth in my head? Maybe that's the frustration. Maybe it's you. All right, now let's get to the part most of us <laughs> wanna talk about, all right? So I wanna show us this scripture. It's two scriptures I wanna show us. Ruth chapter one, Ruth chapter one, verse four. It says, they married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they lived there about 10 years, both Malon and Kilon also died. And Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. We always talk about Ruth and Boaz, but we don't highlight the fact that before Ruth could ever encounter Boaz, Malon had to die. Listen, Ruth chapter two, verse eight. This is when Boaz finally approaches Ruth and he's talking to her. So Boaz says to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in any other field and don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. I have told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whatever, whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men had filled. At this she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, why have I found such favor in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told about all what you have done for your mother-in-law. Look at this, y'all. Since the death of your husband. Pause. Sometimes the reason this break breakup happened is because you were so caught up with Malon, but God truly needs for you to meet Boaz because Ruth and Boaz had a son named Obed and Obed had a son named Jesse and Jesse also had a son named David and Jesus came through the genealogy of David. Sometimes that breakup was for a kingdom purpose, but can you get over Malon? Can you get over Malon? He's my type and I wanted him or she's my type and I wanted her and she had my back and she was always there. And 
now it's over. What I'm trying to do on tonight is to make sure that just because it died doesn't mean something in you dies. Just because it died doesn't mean something in you dies. Many times what we call rejection is redirection for resurrection. Something in you died while dating Melon. I'm, I'm redirecting you to resurrect that part of you, resurrect your joy, resurrect your prayer life. Ever since you were dating Melon, you stop praying, you stop seeking God's face, you stop binge watching sermons, you start drinking alcohol, you start getting hot. Like there, all of these activities start happening. It's not legalism. I want you to notice the downward decline of your faith while you were with Melon. God, had that happen because. I have a Boaz for you. I have something better for you. And maybe, just maybe, we need to look at the scriptures. And Jesus tells us this in Matthew chapter 10. Look at this. It says, now whatever city, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy. And stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. And if the household is worthy, let your presence come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. Can I get somebody to put in the room? I'm getting my peace back. I'm getting my peace back. Okay. He said, listen, if it's worthy, let your peace be on it. But if you and Malon didn't work, let your peace come back to you. If you and Sheila didn't work, let your peace come back to you. If you and Brittany didn't work, let your peace come back to you. If you and James didn't work, let your peace come back to you. Don't leave your peace there. Don't leave your peace in 2017. Don't leave your peace in 2019. I need you to learn how to shake that off. Look, look, I'm right here in the text. It says, and whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Shake off the dust from your feet. I'm trying to get you to see from this biblical snapshot that one of the methods for you to be healthy as you go on to the next village, as you go on to the next relationship, whatever it may be, as you go on to the next opportunity, you got to shake off the dust of Malon. You got to shake off the dust of what happened. You got to shake. And you're like, okay, you don't know what they did to me. Talking about to shake it off. You don't know what they did to me. You're right. I don't. But I do know what bitterness would do to you. Bitterness only contaminates the container. I don't know what they did to you, but I do know what a calloused heart will do to you. Maybe, maybe what we could learn from this passage of scripture, I think Jesus is showing us three things. Number one, staying in a place where you're not received is wasting your time. And wasting time prolongs what's really yours. This is so good, man. Wasting time prolongs what's really yours. Like, what's really yours is Boaz, not Malon. You could be a whole package, but if you end up at the wrong address, the receiver will mishandle you. So I need you to not stay in a place where you're not received. Shake that off. Number two, maybe we can learn from this passage that God always gives us shake it off space. You shake off the dust from that village as you're going to the next village. If you don't shake off what happened with Malon, if you don't shake off what happened with your ex, if you don't shake off what happened with that church hurt, what I'll end up doing is taking old sand into new seasons. And then whoever you're with now, will feel like you're being dusty because your hair is uneven. You're not that cute. You look dusty. <laughs> Maybe I'm dusty because I haven't addressed the sand of the former village. The residue of what I went through, the afterbirth of what I went through is still on me. And the third thing I think Jesus is showing us from this passage is take your peace with you. Take your peace with you. If it didn't work with Malon, there must be a Boaz. If they didn't receive you in that village, 
there must be another village that will. But don't just highlight this part of the sermon. Also notice if I'm the one that is contributing to hurting others. It's not always them. Sometimes it's you. But then other times it was them. And God's trying to show you I have more for you. So I'm going to give you some hard truths and I'm done. Some hard truths that I wish was given to me as I was beginning my Christian evolution. Hard truths. First one is you will miss them. You will miss them. You will think about them. But missing them is not a permission slip to return. You will miss them. You're not in flesh because you miss them. You will miss them when it starts getting cold. Certain holidays, you'll miss them more than others. That's the crazy thing about healing. Healing is a messy process. Like, like one day, you'll be all right. The next day, you'll be crying your eyes out. That doesn't mean you're not normal. You're learning how to grieve over what's still alive. But I had to eulogize. You will miss them. But that's not a permission slip to return. God never cracks a Red Sea so that you can return. He only cracks it so that you could depart. Number two, a hard truth about after the breakup, you're going to have mutual friends. You are going to have mutual friends. Don't make them choose sides. Don't, don't make them choose sides. If you was really my friend, you. this is a breakup you had with them. Not with you had with everybody else who knows them. Don't make them choose sides. But this is something that could be God preparing you for. A Boaz or another village. And you're blaming other people. And it wasn't their fault. This is more about what God is doing with you. And you have to be careful. Because sometimes people remain friends with you to see how you're really doing now that you're no longer with them. Number three, you will get angry. Not you might, you will get angry. Once you start missing them, and then after you start missing them, you have mutual friends and, and you're dealing with a lot, sometimes you will get angry. But that's okay. Be angry, sin not. Grieve properly. Being angry is a part of it. You could be angry over all the time that went by. You could be angry over the lies that they told you. You could be angry over all the time that you feel like you can't get back. It's okay for you to get angry, but don't call, don't allow what is just supposed to be a state to become a season. You could be upset. You could be upset. But understanding it was either divine, it was either a homicide, or something being purified helps. Either I did this or God is purifying me for what he's about to send me to. If it's something I did, I need to get the healing and I need to embrace the season of shaking off sand so that I don't continue this pattern. God loves you just like he loves them. God washed Judah's feet too. So even if I was the one that caused it, God still has good things in store for you. Number four, some things you're going to have to throw away. Now, this is so real, y'all. So practical, but just so real. Some things you're going to have to throw away. You might have to throw away that shirt. You might have to get off social media. Social media is a trigger right now. I'm not, I'm not healed enough because if we be honest, for many of us, social media is a scab picker. I'm trying to heal, but every time I get on, I see them or I see him or her, it just picks a scab. I might need to log off for a second. This might be the space where God's saying, hey, shake this off. Shake this off. There's some things you got to throw away. That keychain brings back too many memories. Throw it away. Throw it away. I'm not talking about anything like, oh, I got a soul tower. I'm talking about things that trigger you until you're in a place where you're healed. Like I articulated before, you're healed not when your cut's not a scab. You're healed when you see the person who cut you and you don't want to cut them back. I have to throw away things that keeps on picking scabs. Number five, we already talked about this. Do an autopsy. Why did this die? Understanding the cause of death is crucial for healing. 
is crucial for healing because I want us to get to a place where we don't question your value if Malon died. Like, don't question your value if this ended. I need you to understand you're so valuable, God is reserving you for where he's sending you. Or you're so valuable where God said, okay, I need, I need to deal with that. A relationship, a relationship is not going to fix this. I need to deal with that. So come with me. Listen. I need to deal with all your wounds. I need to deal with what your mama did. I need to deal with what your ex-husband did. I need to deal with all of that. Come to me and let's evaluate why did this die. Number six, so important. Discover destiny. Purpose expedites healing. You heal faster when you're doing what you were created to do. Which leads me into number seven, pursue destiny. Pursue destiny. Once I understand what I'm supposed to do, it helps me heal because I could recognize that relationship was totally out of purpose. Is anybody there? You're like, look, yeah, it hurt, but I recognize that wouldn't work anyway for what God is calling me to do. That wouldn't have worked for the ministry I'm trying to birth. That wouldn't have. So when I understand what I'm called to do, it helps me heal. Helps me heal. I wanted to come on tonight and have an uncomfortable but needed conversation about after the breakup, what are some necessary steps that I could do? And then also recognizing sometimes, sometimes it's not always the other person, it's me. So God, would you help us to feast on this word? Feast on this word, consume it, and help us to actually evaluate what was the cause of death? Was there something in me that you need to work out of me? Or were you protecting me for where you're sending me? Give me the strength, God, to be able to take my peace with me. Not leave it in the village or leave it in a relationship that happened years ago. I want to give you glory and I want you to be magnified. I don't want to just move on. I want to move on right and I want to move on with health. I pray that you do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.